At Project Pluralist, we are on a mission to eradicate discrimination and hate by cultivating the next generation of pluralist citizens. And with that in mind, our goal on the Pluralist podcast is to discuss and learn from thought leaders, educators, authors, creatives, and more on how to instill pluralist skills and values in our future generation. With me, I have Rabin Sheikh, former extremist turned undercover security intelligence and counterterrorism operative. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Mubin. Thank you for having me, Hina. Absolutely. Mubin, you have testified for United States Security Council, for NATO, uh, for CENTCOM, for Special Operations Command Central. So you've done extensive work for, I would say, North America as well as globally. You've appeared on a lot of different media, CNN, um, ABC, um, MSNBC, and you've talked on the topics and related topics about extremism and terrorism. Um, and currently you are part of a Memphis-based organization called uh, Parents for Peace, and you uh, are continuing to do a lot of, um, a lot of work um, around anti and counter extremism. Um, so thank you for coming on the show. Would you like to add something to this, this list of introduction? Uh, no, I think that's, that's enough. <laughs> Great. Um, So the conversation that we want to have today is going to be um, a little bit more also about, you know, your personal experience, your lived experience as first generation uh, Canadian Muslim, and also your experience being on the other side of, you know, of your journey into um, what we call as extremist ideologies or hate ideology coming out of it, being on the other side, being uh, on counter extremism uh, measures in the work you've done. And just general, um, you know, advice that you give to parents. You also work for this organization for Parents for Peace. Um, and we're going to explore uh, some of those topics as well. So starting from um, life as a first generation Canadian, you mentioned in your TEDx um, about the conflict between the society that you are living in and some of the cultural and religious norms that you were growing up at home and when you were going to the mosque. Uh, and that conflict created this, uh, the, this sort of thing for you to go and seek something. And that's where you ended up meeting um, what you later found were the Taliban. And so, and which changed your journey from being just a, you know, a, a usual Canadian uh, teenager. Tell us a little bit about that conflict, about this entire journey. Yeah, um, so identity conflicts feature very prominent in the uh, in this context. This context being, let's call it, uh, you know, the uh, radicalization trajectory in the West. Okay, very generally speaking. And again, it, we have to be general because, you know, to start off, it's very important to understand that everybody's journey is individual, right? It's very, it's relative to the individual and it's relative to that individual's uh, position in their particular society in which they're living. So you could have, you know, two brothers from the same family living in the same home whose trajectories are different, right? So what I'm trying to establish at the outset here is that it's very individualistic. Uh, Obviously what is true for me may not be true for somebody else. And in fact, is not true for most other people. Um, But there are, I think, certain general concepts which do apply across the board, whether you're in, you know, in North America, whether you're in Europe. And that's why I mentioned the West, right? As if, you know, the West is some monolithic entity, which it's not. Uh, The experiences of Muslims in Canada is going to be different from the US, is going to be different from the UK, is going to be different from the Netherlands, is going to be different from Australia. Um, So it's important for us to realize that there are these different elements involved. But of course, because the West, quote unquote, does have certain uh, generic traits, if you will. So for example, their political systems are generally the same. Um, And so within this, you find um, members of minority groups who are first or even second generation or maybe even third generation we're still trying to figure out what is their role in their in their life, uh, in the place in which they're living, right? So 
you know, I'm a Muslim kid in Canada versus the UK, for example, right? The UK, let's say, has a colonial history, right? Uh, as a colonizer. In fact, Canada was a colony of, of Britain. Um, so, and again, you know, Canada does not have this imperialistic or colonizing background. We have our own issues, maybe, um, and, you know, as uh, people who are trying to draw awareness to injustices historically or currently, you know, we have our issues with our First Nations people in Canada. This is similar to Australia. Australia was a colony as well. Although we are all members of the so-called British Commonwealth, uh, they were not colonized, and they too have issues with their Aborigines. So there are similarities in some cases, and then there are differences. But within this context is this journey of, or this conflict over meaning, belonging, and identity. And this is something that affected me very greatly in my particular. Hmm. And so, I mean, now we're talking, so there's this almost a majority minority conflict, right? So you mentioned the West and I can even broaden it up and say Muslim majority country versus Muslim minority countries. And the thing of like what overall culture or society is versus the smaller culture, and especially if you've come from somewhere else. And so there's a conflict between that. Um, how, how do you, so you, what you went through and what your journey was, um, how do you think it needs to be resolved? if tables were turned and if you could do it again, or if you were to give somebody else advice of, you know, somebody else, a teenager who's going through this, how do you even bring it all together and make sense of this? Yeah. So I, I like to be very honest with, uh, if, I'm, if I'm talking to a teenager or, you know, somebody who's, let's say, cause I'm, we're dealing with some people who are in prison, you know, on terrorism offenses, uh, some of whom are converts, right? So you have this, you know, uh, range of individuals, right? And their experiences are very different, in some cases similar, whatever. So let's start with the younger crowd, right? I think that's a little bit easier. And, you know, I always look back to what I was going through, you know, in, my, in, in those days before, let's say, I became extremist. When I was living my regular high school life or my regular teenage life, and very similar to what the vast majority of Muslim teenagers are going through, which is an identity crisis. Or, you know, what is uh, our, my role, right? How do I belong in society? This is, you know, especially for those of us who grow up in a very strict Muslim home um, who have been taught the, the, this idea that, first of all, we always, we separate things into a very black and white thing. So, so what I mean to say is Muslim and non-Muslim. Mm. And this creates a black and white thinking, right? Black and white fallacy. Okay. Um, and this is a problem. This is a problem in Muslim community because when we live in a country and we say, oh, this is a kafir country or this is a country for the kuffar, well, then we are excluding ourselves from the country. We are doing the marginalization. I was just talking yesterday about this topic as well. And yes, everyone has the right to dress the way they want. And if you want to wear a big beard and you want to wear a turban and you want to, want to wear a, a thobe, you have the right to do that, right? Because you live in a Western country where, you know, the, the makeup of the country or the, or the country is based on this notion of individual rights, okay? And this is something strange in, to, to the Muslim context. Okay, the Muslim context generally favors the, the society, right? Like the greater good, not the individual right. So in a Western country where we have these individual rights and people dress the way they dress, you know, I, I make the argument that in fact, you are marginalizing yourself from society because you're telling people that I don't want to be like. You. Now, of course, we're not saying that you need to be like everybody else. The society itself kind of, teaches people that, right? But when you look like you just came from Peshawar, Pakistan, or you came from somewhere in Afghanistan and you look like those people look, people are going to treat you that way, right? And especially if you are the, especially more hardcore, 
uh, you know, these are they're not Muslims, and we've already created this otherness, right? This otherization of the entire society in which we live. So I'm not surprised that Muslim kids are having issues with their identity, meaning, and belonging in these societies because we have self-marginalized ourselves. We have done that. Hmm. And for those who want to be a part of the society, they are looked at as sellouts. They have, you know, and this idea that you've sold out your religion, right? Like, what does that even mean, right? Is it, does it mean that just because you have, like, you are a, a normal person, meaning that you have a job like everyone else has, you know, you go to work, you, you raise your family like other people are raising your family. Are you not doing what Islam has commanded you to do? Because Islam tells you, you know, raise your family, right? Protect your family from the, in, from the afterlife, from the hellfire is what, was, is what we teach ourselves. So, so there is this, I think, uh, confusion as to what we are even supposed to be doing. And so somebody who has, let's say, a regular nine to five job, you know, have, have they, like, are they what, are they any less Muslim or are they a bad Muslim because they work for non-Muslims or they're working in a society of non-Muslims? So this is, I think, a core issue, something that we need to tell ourselves as Muslims that we belong in these societies, right? We are here to, if, if you think that we are here to show people Islam, well, then show people your Islam. Well, what's the point of you showing your Islam to other Muslims? Right. Mm -hmm. if, if that's the point. So so I, I know I kind of went off on a tangent here, but what I'm trying to say is and then something that I would tell young people as well is that this is your society. Right. Like this is your home, especially if you're born here. This is your home. So you need to behave like that, right. You need to show even if the society around you is against your religion as you see it or, you know, this, of course, even for me now, I'm 44 years old. And of course, it bothers me if. I see somebody making fun of the Prophet alayhi salam and, you know, doing what they do or insulting Islam. Of course, you should feel something in your heart that this is bad and this bothers you. But what are you going to do about it? And, and this is, I think, uh, I think the crux of the matter is that a lot of young Muslims, they see this and they don't know how to respond just generally to just the non-Muslim society they live in or specifically to targeted harassment of Muslims. And mm. so this, I think, is something that should go into um, identity construction to teaching people to realize that this is the society in which you live. This is the kind of junk you might have to hear and deal with. So how are you going to deal with it? How are you going to respond to it? And this, I think, is the, is the problem today because most young people don't have the skills, are not given the skills to deal with these issues. And so the immediate reaction is one of anger and then eventually violence. And then this just, you know, um, it, it's just a circle of violence that we keep running, running around. These are, these are really good points. Um, because as a, you know, so I'm a, uh, I'm an immigrant, right? So my, my children would be first generation. And so I've seen this trend and, you know, coming from South Asia, coming from Pakistan, I've seen a lot of people who are, who I feel when I, when I lived there, I feel like people, some of the people were, they would still have this boundary of like, you know, black and white, Muslim, non-Muslim world, Muslim, non-Muslim. You, you hear it so often that you don't even think about like that this is a way of discrimination and otherization. You know, you just think that's your worldview, but then you don't see people, the dressing conservatively or dressing in a certain way, like you're dressed like how everybody else is dressed around you, right? And people wear jeans and even women, it, it's totally okay. And then you come here and then you find a completely different understanding of South Asians. You see more and more of like um, Arab clothing sometimes. And you're like, I'm so confused. Where are you from again? And so there's, there's less openness and it just seems like more closed up community where you're just interacting with just people like you when you have such a wider context around. And it seems like this happens a lot when, when like you're going in and you want to sort of preserve who you are. And there's so much fear about if you even let a little thing slide, the whole thing is just going to collapse. And I feel like that's, 
there's this thing that happens with new immigrants anyways, but when there's a religious context, and I see a lot of that um, within the Muslim community in, in, in North America. Yeah, the, this, is a, this is a thing, a point that I've heard made often is, you know, they, they tend to be more strict here than they are over there. And like you said, it's, it's that fear of losing their religion, losing their culture, right? Um, and, and this is one of the reasons why, one of the main reasons I think that when immigrants come here, they are so strict on their kids. Now, this is a huge problem and completely counterproductive because this is, again, this is something that, you know, old world mentality, if I can use that phrase, why it fails. It fails because, number one, it doesn't take into consideration the society in which you're living. You are inundated, inundated on a daily basis in, in a Western society of things that we consider to be irreligious and non-religious. Um, look at the hyper-sexualization of the society we live in. When you're coming from a conservative Muslim society and you come here, this is, it's night and day. It's a completely different, uh, it's an opposite uh, situation. And when you have parents coming from that background thinking that they can force compliance onto their children, they realize that it, it, it's not, well, they don't realize, unfortunately, but um, you will realize eventually that it's not going to work because what you're doing is you are putting the children in a vice. You're squeezing them from one side and the society is squeezing them from the other side. So what's happening to you in the middle? You're being, you're being squished. You're being crushed. And what's happening is this is why a lot of these Muslim kids who are first generation, even second generation, you know, what we find, so there are, there are different trajectories that we find come out of this. So let's say on the, you know, one end of it, they will, they will lose their religion. In, in some cases, they lose their religion because too much force and they're basically forced to pick a side. So they're gonna they're not gonna pick your side, they're gonna pick the society the society side because that's where they live, that's where they're gonna be living for the next, you know, for the rest of their life, unless they move back or they move somewhere else. So some of them, in an extreme case, they will lose their religion. Um, and and you see this a lot, you know. Uh, you know, there's uh you see this phenomenon a lot. People, you know, kids of Muslims, they've lost their religion. Um, then you might get, then let's establish the other end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is the kids will become even more hardcore than their own parents. Uh, and they become very hard. And that is their way to protect their religious they understand it from the influences from the society around them. So now there's a huge middle zone, right? And in that middle zone, you get, you know, you have, let's say, closer to the, you know, the left side, if you will very secularized, you know, there's not really, you know, they, they might still self-identify as, they might call themselves cultural Muslims or whatever it is, but they will still at least uh, use Islam as their identity or at least a part of their identity. And, they're, and they positively engage with it and, and interact with other members of the community and society accordingly. And on the other side of that spectrum, and just, you know, less extreme from the person who doubles down on their religion and culture, are those who have a, I will call it, a moderate understanding. I don't like the term moderate Islam, like it's either Islam or it's not, but let's call it, let's call it moderate, right? Uh, moderate on this spectrum, because moderate from, you know, measured against the extremism of those who become real hardcore. Moderate in the sense that they are more than, they're not secular per se. I mean, some of them might not necessarily wear Islam on their sleeve or on their head or on their face, but they, they pray, you know, they have a good relationship with their religion and their functional, positive members of society. This is what I think, you know, Islam expects of people. Not necessarily that, and, and I've become a lot more liberal over the years. I, I don't believe that you necessarily need to be hardcore in your face Muslim, right? Uh, because I think that turns people away. Uh, and especially, you know, me being like, you know, Naqshbandi Sufi Muslim, mm. you know, we want to give a positive image of Islam to people. 
So the best way to do that is just be a good person. Be a good person and people will see that, oh, this is the Islam that this person believes. Right? Just like on the other end, you know, you might find people who are not practicing at all and are engaged in criminality and drug use and this, that, and the other. And people see that and they say, oh, you're Muslim and you do this. So, so it, it's on this whole spectrum, you know, that you will find all these different trajectories. And this is the difficulty is because you don't know where a person is on that journey, especially mm -hmm. when they are still in their formative years. Right. The, one of the main conflict part is this idea of community, right? So there's this concept of community, which in Arabic is called Ummah. And it's almost like the rest of the world that is not Arabic speaking, which is the majority of the Muslim world, thinks Ummah means like only Muslims. And it has to be broken down to say like that means community. So community is where you live. But I don't think most people understand that aspect of community is your society, community is the place where you live rather than community is your religious association only. What do you um, yeah. think about that dynamic? So this is an important point because, you know, now we're getting into a little bit of ideology, right? Like, it, and it's really, it's, so for example, the concept of ummah is a generic, let's say a general Islamic understanding, general Islamic belief, okay, that, that the Muslims are all, you know, um, an ummah, meaning we are the ummah of Muhammad, alayhi salam, right? We are the people, we are a people or a community, if you want to call it that. Again, there are so many ways you can, you know, translate that word. Um, but we say that when we say ummah of Muhammad, alayhi salam, that we are followers of the, of the Prophet, alayhi salam. Okay, but that is, a, that is in terms of religious beliefs and doctrine, okay? Um, and what, what does that mean? So, you know, there's a famous hadith about, um, you know, the ummah is like one body. When a part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts, okay? And many people have taken this to mean solidarity. So that if Muslims in China, the Uyghur Muslims are being oppressed or persecuted, then the Muslims in South Africa should feel for them, okay? And this is fine. This is normal. This is what any any group that has shared values would believe if they're if they're you know their people quote unquote are being persecuted somewhere they are going to feel it themselves wherever they are okay and in psychology that we call this you know vicarious suffering hmm. so for example a muslim kid was living in the west who doesn't see the bombs and the killings and the suffering goes online and sees the bombings and the killings and the suffering suddenly starts to feel that I am suffering from that. My people are suffering, so I am suffering because mm -hmm. a part of the ummah is suffering, so now I feel that I must suffer because of that. And that becomes a factor, right, for some people. But the problem is, is that, you know, there's another way to look at it. One guy says that, you know, if your finger, if you're using your finger and your, your shoulder hurts and your face hurts and your chest hurts, and your leg hurts, maybe it's your finger that's broken, right? So, so one argument could be that the way in which we look at the world, thinking that I have to feel for you know, what's happening over there and I need to take action, this might be a mistaken view, right? Um, because again, ummah, it, it means one thing when we know that it means common values, common beliefs of the religion. But it, it does also mean humans in general, right? Doesn't necessarily mean Muslims only, right? So when we say, for example, there is a uh, fame, there's a hadith, uh, Sahih hadith, authentic, which talks about the Prophet salam says, from my ummah will emerge a people who will recite the Quran, but it will not go beyond their throat. He said that, and they will appear again and again throughout history. And he said this 10 times. Until from their last remnants, the Antichrist will emerge. So look at this. The Prophet is saying that from my ummah, 
this group will emerge, and from this group, the Antichrist will emerge. So are these people Muslims? Is it possible that the Antichrist could emerge from a Muslim group, like people who are actually real Muslims? Mm. We would say no, but yet the word Ummah is used here. Mm -hmm. So that's another way to look at it, to kind of open up that term Ummah, what does it mean? And so some people do say that, no, Ummah means humanity, all of humanity whether Muslim or not. So you can have a shared religious understanding with some people. So for example, even me living in Canada, you know, I'm a Muslim and many people around me are not Muslim. Okay, so we don't have a shared religious platform, if you will, but we are all, you know, brothers in, and sisters in humanity, at least. And the Sufis are big on this, right? The Sufis talk about, you know, when you see somebody or somebody who is, you don't ask them, if somebody is poor, you don't ask them, are you Muslim or not Muslim, before you give them charity. You don't ask them their religion. Mm -hmm. If they are hurt or something, or they need your help, you don't ask them first, are you Muslim? Excuse me. What kind, are you a Sunni Muslim? Are you a Sunni Sufi Muslim? Are you a Sunni Sufi Naqshbandi Muslim? We don't, we don't do that. So this is, I think, something that even young people who are uh, who are being taught, you know, what is Islam and what is Ummah, this is something that we, we fail to understand. And if we stick to only this interpretation that no, Ummah only means Muslim, then we are going to constantly live in this state of otherization. Constantly. Right. And so the, it's almost like this very segregation mindset because the identity we 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 don't have we're not monolith as human beings we have multiple identities some identities are things like culture um nationality where you live city states or provinces uh, you know religion is part of that race or ethnicity is part of that sometimes it's even role that we all have you know a role of a child a parent a caregiver like all of these things come together and they start to overlap with a lot of other people that we might not have a shared value on one aspect but we have a lot of shared value or experiences on other aspects so you already mentioned this idea of identity construction and how do we talk to younger people of identity as one not being a singular one and this idea that it's not a singular construction we have so many different identities as human beings and we overlap with these identities with other human beings with such identities how do we talk about this concept and and do you think that can open things up rather than reducing to a singular notion of things that's a very good very good point because the idea this issue of multiple identity is it's studied is something that scholars have studied across society um, and certainly for whether it's especially for young people because they they do need this identity construction or help with identity construction and identity protection um, the important thing is to so for example i always filter everything through the islamic paradigm right i'm one of those people who who, who do that um, you know, for me, everything like, you know, I, I, because I'm Indian background, right? And I grew up, you know, in an Indian, in an Indian family and seeing the way that culture went. And, and I realized even when I was a teenager that I did not want to be, I didn't want to even get married to an Indian person because I knew that I was living in Canada and this was going to be where I'm going to pretty much, you know, live. And my future generation is also going to live here. So I thought to myself that I would deliberately marry even out of my culture because I did not like some aspect of Indian culture. And because what I learned from the religion, I realized that, wait a second, this conflicts with the religion. And so I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I did consider that I had, I was a product of Canadian culture. So Western culture, if you will. Um, and you know, again, what does that mean? Right. But, but I grew up with notions of, you know, equal rights between men and women, for example, right. This is something that was, you know, reinforced through schooling, 
through my, you know, peer groupings, like people that we hung out with. And so I remember telling myself, I'd, I didn't even want to be Indian. Now, and you mentioned this point earlier about, you know, where culture and religion do mix and sometimes it does. And so, and so how does one navigate? Well, what's the religious part and what's the cultural part, right? Because there are, like I said, some things that, that do not conflict. And in fact, culture is even used as a proof in Islamic law. It's called the urf. Urf is the custom in mm. which you live and where you live. And the urf, if it did not conflict with Islamic beliefs, was something that you could use. So I look back to the, if you look back in the early Islamic, Islamic history period of the fuqaha, of the jurists, uh, a great example is... Um, you know, uh, um, Imam Shafi'i. Imam Shafi'i is one of the four mujtahid imams. And, you know, he studied his thing, you know, in one place, in the Hijaz. And then when he went to Egypt, he realized that the society was very different than it was in the Hijaz. And in fact, many of his opinions changed. His, his legal opinion, like Islamic legal opinion. And, you know, some people think that Islamic law is so rigid in this sense. But in fact, you realize it's actually not that rigid because for this mujtahid imam to change his opinion because of what he experienced in a different society and the culture that it came with tells you that, in fact, you can play around with that. And that's something that I think young Muslims need to hear because this is what prevents you from rejecting your cultural background completely, right? Because that's not a solution either. Remember, I mentioned on that and that spectrum, that one extreme is they leave their culture and their religion completely, right? Mm -hmm. So, in order to prevent that or to protect from that, and to assist with the creation of a healthy identity, is to show them that here, here is what Islam teaches, and to give them actually a relaxed form of Islam that it, to remind people that Islam is not as rigid as you know the Saudis might tell you or the Salafis, like some who are strict Salafis. You know, I, I don't want to disparage all the Salafis, of course, um, but I do want to say that there is this mentality that I see very prominent in Salafi circles, and I was among them, I was with them in their Salafi circles, that teaches people this rigid, rigid way of life where basically, you know, uh, to them, Allah is frozen in a, in a desert in Arabia, hmm. you know, they create this understanding that we must live like the Prophet alayhi salam lived, or we must live like the Sahaba. Years ago. Like life as it was 1400 years ago. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's impossible. That is impossible. Time moves forward. We don't move back. And you'll notice something. When they say we have to live like the Prophet alayhi salam lived, or the Salaf al-Salih lived, the first three generations. Well, where did 1,300 years of history go? Down the drain, right? All the science that took place, all the mixing that Muslims did into other societies and how they developed unique identities and unique cultures in those societies. That's all gone down the drain. And when we don't, and this is the thing, how do you talk to kids about that? You show them that this is a history that we have of over 1,400 years that encompasses many different areas of the world. Take, for example, when the early Muslims, you know, I always give an example, Muslims and Islam in many cases did spread by military force. That is a fact of, of life, okay? Um, Muslims showed up on the shores of Spain with a navy on the shores of France with a navy. We didn't go there with lollipops and rainbows, right? But at the same time, look at Southeast Asia. If you go to Indonesia, Malaysia, and those areas, there were no armies that were sent to those places. And yet those places are majority Muslim. How, why? And we say because uh, Muslim businessmen and business people went there and they interacted with the society and they were so honest and good with the people that the people themselves said, who are, like, look how good these people are. There must be something true about what they believe for them to behave like. 
And so people became Muslim because of that. So you have these different cultures. Looking at India, for example, you know, you have, you see today, you know, there's a animosity towards Islam in India by, you know, I'll say it by the government. Why? Because they feel that Islam took their society away, took their identity, their Hindu identity away. Now they forget, you know, in the early period, yes, in fact, Sufi Muslims arrived in India and Sufi Muslims were responsible for spreading Islam without any forcing people, right? Forcing of people. If you look at, and what I'm trying to show you is the different examples and influences that Muslims had on cultures and societies. You know, Sikhism. Sikhism only became a religion. Why? Because the, you know, because he was he was basically hanging out with one Sufi and one Hindu, one Hindu sadhu, like a, a mystic, right? And then, so the point I'm trying to show is that even in India, you had the good Muslim ruler who was invaded and attacked by another Muslim ruler, right? Yeah. And and he was a bad ruler, and 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 Hindus totally dislike him because of what he did, and rightfully so because he oppressed the people, forcing people to convert, destroying temples, converting them into masjids. So so this shows you that throughout that history, we've gone to Spain. I mean, Islam was in Spain for hundreds of years. You know, Jewish religion uh, flourished and Jewish philosophy flourished under Muslim rule in Spain. Why? We didn't go around forcing people to convert. So, so this is to show these young people who are trying to understand that Islam is not about trying to live like the Arabs lived in the Arabian desert in the 600s or the 700s. That's not Islam, right? Islam, the belief, yes, came in the Quran and came in the Sunnah of the Prophet But this was this is so that people could live in any society that they went to, whether they went to China and they went to China, whether they went to the Americas and they even went to the Americas, okay. wherever they went, they could still be Muslim and be a part of that society. Yeah. And so it, it's uh, the two words that come to my mind are one is diverse and the other is context. So the context that you live in and the context that the religion went to and how it went and then what happened over time that builds there's a there's a diversity of the kinds of muslims you know there are different cultures different languages different histories different experiences different way of sometimes doing certain things and that's the whole point where you know diversity and context usually people think oh that doesn't go with with muslims or islam but those are the two major things. There's a reason why in every country, in every region, it looks different. People look different. They speak different language. They have different, you know, cultures. And so it's almost like, seems to me with this identity construction, um, having those two things, like framing that, hey, the context that you live in and the idea that even within the Muslim world or Muslim people, there's a lot of diversity. And then you figure out who, who, which one are you, who are you, and who do you want to be rather than, a, you know, sort of a, a framing that comes and you just get molded into one um, and trying to find your own thing. Um, you've, since you've been a counter um, extremism expert, you've worked with youth, you've also worked with a lot of white supremacists as well, you know, the former white supremacists. Um, I'm actually going to have Arno in one of the awesome He's arno is awesome conversation yeah and so um do you see certain similarities with the any kind of extreme like any sort of extremist ideology either based on religion or race or you know nationality or ethnicity yeah yeah you do actually see quite a few overlaps let me give you an anecdote here uh so we uh, we went to germany and we were talking to um criminal intelligence department in Stuttgart, Germany. And these were, you know, white Germans who were investigating Islamists or jihadists, whatever you want to term you want to use. Bad Muslims, okay? Extremists, bad Muslims. And the guy says to me, he says, uh, you know, when we were first, I, he says to me, you know, I investigated neo-Nazis. 
you know, in the 80s, the neo-Nazis were a big movement in Germany. And I investigated for many, many years. And then when things died down and things changed around, and then jihadists became the issue, they tasked me to be an investigator against these guys. And I thought to myself, how am I going to investigate these people? Like, I don't know their culture. I don't know their religion. How am I going to investigate? Them? And then he says to me, we realized as we watched them and observed them, that in fact, they were very similar to the neo-Nazis, right? So, I, and, and this is great because when he started to say this to me, I thought to myself, yeah, what, how do you even do that? If you feel you're an investigator and like you feel, how am I going to do this? So he says, you know, the neo-Nazis would hang out at particular places, right? So they would socialize around, they would have their places of socialization. So these extremists, they had the same thing. Some of them were hanging around certain extremist mosques and that's where they would hang out. Okay. Number two, he says, we realized that uh, that sense of brotherhood and family was a huge component, especially for young people who may have been having issues with their parents, who may have had issues with their school or workplace or whatever. And for whatever reason, many reasons that they feel that they did not belong, they would seek out individuals who were like them so that they would feel that they belong. So that there's your number two, your sense, that sense of brotherhood and belonging is something that was common in both. Number three, you had a cohesive ideology. So whether it was the belief in white power or it was a belief in Muslim power, uh, it was the same thing. Whether you believed that they were mud people or, you know, however they disparagingly referred to as non-whites, the extremists would say, kufar, these kufar, they're all kufar, otherization, right? Hmm. Um, the idea of they had, the neo-Nazis had racial holy war. Hmm. Well, what the extremists call it, jihad. Right? They misuse jihad, of course. Uh, we don't believe what they are doing is jihad. Jihad is a legitimate uh, conflict, uh, you know, uh, 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 a war tradition with rules of engagement. Right? And, and I always define this, you know, terrorism is to jihad what war crimes are to rules of engagement. Or terrorism is to jihad what adultery is to marriage. Right? Mm. So, so the ideas that they had were actually very, very similar, but they just, the label was a different label. Hmm. So, so you see this, you see, in fact, when you strip away the labels, you realize that the mechanisms are the same, meaning in belonging, identity, um, you know, ideology, you know, so these things were similar. So, um, so it, it is, it's kind of funny that I did end up, meeting with and becoming colleagues with people who normally we would we would be at war with each other you know and so it's interesting because you know i am i'm sufi and arno is a buddhist hmm. and buddhists and sufis are actually very very similar in the way yep. that they view the world you know so it just in, on your whole discussion about how how we come from totally different backgrounds totally different but yet we have a shared platform, right? Mm. We still maintain our separateness, right? I mean, Buddhists don't even believe in God, okay? Mm. We maintain our separateness, but our common values are the same, right? Reducing suffering, the, the notion of love as more powerful than hate. You know, these are things that we, we all, I think, need to understand and really implement inside ourselves. That's the only way we're going to get through this. Hmm. That's, that's a really good point. And that's what I hear a lot. And, you know, when I first started working on this, that's literally was the crux of my entire thesis of like, the similarities are just, you know, mind blowing where you you feel like it's just same thing repackaged in a different material with a different context. Um, so you, you were mentioning, there was a time and this is a time, you know, uh, this is how you got involved. There was a lot of interpersonal communication of somebody meeting people 
um, in person, finding that group to force a, sel- a sense of belonging, to figure out your identity or to make a new identity. A lot of when teenagers are going through this, now they don't have to go to a person per se. You know, you have all these devices, you have the internet, a, a, a click off a button and you've gone down a rabbit hole. And there's, there's a whole gamut of new apps and things that have come to track, you know, what is your child doing to just make sure, but kids find a way. They find a way through all of that. How, how do we minimize that? Because now they're living in their bubbles and you can't even reach that. How do you ensure that, you know, either they understand what they're doing or what they're seeking or how do you now navigate this thing as parents, educators, as a society? Yeah, this is a, it's a tricky question because on one hand, especially in a society here where, you know, children, obviously they have rights, and, um, uh, you know, you need to give them their space. But at the same time, if you give them too much space, you know, then they'll, then they'll float away, basically. Be carried away by the current. Um, and it's, it's difficult, right? Um, it's easy to say, oh, you know, parents, keep an eye on your kids. But what, I mean, what does that mean, right? But there are certain things that you can, you can see, right? Certain signs. One of the things that we say is, um, you know, they will tell you what they believe, right? They will, you will hear it, you know? So right off the bat, if you start to see, you know, um, kids referring to other groups in very generalized terms and disparaging them in generalized terms, then these are warning signs that they're definitely, they're getting this from someone, right? Somebody's telling them this or they're seeing it or, you know, they're receiving it somehow, right? And you can, you can, I mean, you know, whether it's online or whether it's in person um, is irrelevant. What's, what's relevant is the impact that it's going to have on that person, on that child. So number one is looking to see if they view other people in, in a very general way, uh, whether it's all Jews or all Christians or all non-Muslims, whatever it is, um, they, will, they will show these things. And, um, you know, the best way to deal with that is to actually discuss these issues, right? is to openly discuss them, right? And especially as adults, it's weird because I run into this problem with my own kids, okay? When I try to explain things to them, like the logic of how things work, oh, they don't want to hear it, right? Oh, well, how, who are you to tell me? What do you know? You know, I'm 17. I know everything, right? And it, it's funny because I did the same thing to my own parents, okay? I knew everything. I'm educated. You're not. Like, my parents are from India. They, they, they still speak with a very you know, a recognizable accent, okay? But I went to public school, right? I have non-Muslim friends. I have a wider, I know better, right? So how are you going to explain to, how are you going to convince, you know, kids who think like that, that you do know better? So you can. All you can do is lay the foundation, okay? It's, It's like bricks on a road. All you can do is put those bricks down, put those bricks down. And what those kids will be doing is they'll just, you know, meander along that path thinking they know everything until they realize when they look down wait a second is a brick road that i'm walking right that's that's the only way that you're going to deal with it you will never ever and i don't even think i don't even think this is possible uh, but you will never convince your child in one setting or even in a few settings what the situation is right just get that out of your head I don't think that you're, you're going to argue it into them or you're going to intellectually convince them because their brains are physically not even fully developed, mm-hmm. right? You can't even use your logic because we as developed human beings, you know, we're, we're at that point. We, can, we understand logic. We understand long-term consequences, strategic thinking. They do not. Their prefrontal cortexes are not even developed. So you're, you're, you might as well be talking to a wall. Right. In many cases, you are talking to a wall, you know, so so I, I would just say that uh, you have to be, you know, easy. You have to be easy with them. And even if they are going to do things, um, you know, that like, let's say whether it's, you know, very easy one, hanging out with friends and 
you know, uh, they might come home late or whatever it is. The best thing to do is just have that positive relationship with them to let them know that, listen, you know what? No matter where you are, I don't care. Okay, you're going out with your friends. I don't even care what you're doing. Just don't break the law. You know, if police show up here, like I'm not going to protect you, right? If, if you get arrested, you get arrested. Um, but to give them the confidence that even if I screw up and I go, let's say I went to a house party or something and something happened and my friend got drunk and now, you know, there's nobody to drive, you know, because you tell your kids don't get into a car with a drunk driver, you know, these basic values, tell them these things. And even if they're calling you from a house party saying, listen, come pick me up because nobody's here. Th this is how you engage positively. Believe me, even me as a parent, I feel it all the time that I'm, I'm compromising my authority and I'm giving away my authority because I'm not able to, you know, um, um, force it through. Force it. Even I feel that, right, as a parent, and any parent would feel that it's natural. But as adults, we have to realize that sometimes we have to kind of let things go a little bit because the greater objective we have is more important. So mm -hmm. that's that's a better way for parents to look at it. You will not you will absolutely not succeed in, uh, you know, cutting them off of the internet, taking away their device. And that is not going to, that is not going to do it. And what you need to do is just discuss these topics honestly and open because realizing that we are the ones with life experience, they are not hmm. right. And to explain to them that, well, this is how things work in the world. I know sometimes they'll take that as you being patronizing, or you being condescending, right? They use these words. They don't even know what the words mean, okay? They just know that they don't like you telling them, okay? But that's, that's, the, that's the job of kids, okay, is to always push back. Mm. And our job is just to be solid and secure with our understanding and our values and just keep moving forward. Mm. That's, these are very, very good advice. And, uh, and it just- I got three teenagers. Okay, three of them. And yeah. two of them are one's 21 and one's 18. And then the others are, you know, 11 to 16. So crucial, crucial ages yeah. and very, yeah. very difficult ages. So uh, yeah, it's worse than it's worse than fighting jihadis. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very difficult age. Um, so you're a parent and you're also part of this organization, Parents for Peace. If you could tell us, you know, briefly what, what it does and what your role is in that organization. Yeah. So Parents for Peace was formed uh, by um, um, Marvin, who, whose son actually um, converted to Islam and then got a little, you know, he was already, you know, um, he was already having difficulties in society, right? African-American, um, probably, you know, the victim of racism, probably the victim of institutional unemployment, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, and then becomes a Muslim goes to Yemen and studies Arabic there and gets more. What I think was happening is that extreme otherization was occurring. Um, and, and, you know, in Yemen, especially, you know, the Salafi types who he was with, who hate America as it is anyway, were feeding him all this stuff. And then when he came back to the U S um, ended up, um, opening fire on a military facility, killing mm. one soldier and wounding another and got arrested and was sentenced to life in prison. So he wanted to basically make sense for other parents, how this could happen and mm. what he could do about it. And so this actually, it started as that. And then it became this large organization with parents from different backgrounds who were, who were impacted by extremism in one way or another. And whether their their kid got killed because you had some who joined ISIS and went to Syria and died, hmm. uh, you had some who you know got arrested in terrorism prosecutions and are now in prison, um, and and the long term questions of like what do you do with them, what do you do with those who who will get out eventually, you know what's being done for them while they're in the prison. You know, the U.S. doesn't have a de-radicalization program in the prison. Uh, and nor do they have any kind of post-prison programming, right? So 
how do you deal with them? That kid now is probably double traumatized or that young adult is now a full adult who spent several years in a, you know, U S prison and with no rehabilitation programs, you think that person is going to come out more stable or more unstable. Mm. And unfortunately you won't know that until it's too late. So the idea of parents for peace is to, is to be a place for parents to have a non-judgmental, you know, safe place, if you will, with other like-minded parents who are going through similar things. It's, it's a nonpartisan organization. We don't talk about politics. Uh, we're not interested in politics. We're interested in helping these parents deal with their situation. And so uh, there is a number even. We have a helpline that you can call. It's 1-8-999-1-8-444-9222. That's one eight four 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 nine peace, and that's for both parents and educators to call in to say, look, you know, it's it, there's no connection to government on that line, so it's safe in that sense. It's all anonymized. Uh, the the people who answer there, you know, it's the psychotherapist, uh, individuals who can help. Whether you're an employer, an educator, a parent, just to ask questions. Look, my kid is doing this. Should I be worried? You know, one of the common questions we get is. You know, my kid uh, converted, let's say, converted to Islam, or the kid is already a Muslim, but has become more observant, is mm. growing a beard, is wearing a hijab, is wearing whatever. Um, that is not a, a sign that a person is becoming extreme just because they become more religious, mm. right? But if they're becoming more religious and they're talking about how all Jews and all Christians and all Americans then it's a problem, right? You have to look at basically what, we're, what we try to explain is that there are a cluster of factors that you want to look at before you should start getting worried, hmm. okay? Clearly, if you start to see things in and around the home, uh, purchases being made for items that are out of the ordinary, hmm. items that might actually be used for not good purposes, Items that you might see with your own eyes as a parent in the room. I don't, of course, suggest, you know, if you're going to uh, your kid's room, you know, that you start looking through their drawers and, you know, that's an invasion of their privacy and you're going to totally compromise a relationship with them. But if you can see with your open eyes something that's right there, uh, and, and parents have seen this, you know, like explosives material, you know, or propaganda, right? It could be a kid who's got like a white power pamphlet, you know? And, and if you see that, we teach parents and others that you don't freak out on them. You don't jump down their throat. You ask them nicely. And like, even I always say, ask them like you're dumb, you know, like you're the dumb parent. Hey, what's this? What's that about? And get them to talk and ask them questions. Like what are the, so these are the kinds of things that Parents for Peace try to educate parents and, and uh, teachers and others on what they need to look for and how they have to be and how they should deal with it. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, you know, again, even for parents, I, I tell them that like, be merciful to your kid, you know, be merciful. Like, you know, regardless of what family background you came from, I came from a strict Indian family background. I had to be home before sunset. Okay. And before the sun set. And if I didn't, I would get my beats. Okay. My beatings, you know, the chappal, the famous, you know, slipper of the mother. Right. Um, and I tell parents, you know, like it, this society in which we live, you need to be very careful. If you, if you push your kids away, they will be pushed into the open arms of extremists and other predators who will gladly take your kids away from you. Hmm. So, you know, so choose wisely, both the kids and the parents. Thank you, Mubin. This was this was extremely, extremely helpful. I'm sure it's going to be helpful for the parents, for educators, for even youth who are going to be watching and who are going to be listening. Um, and these are the advice that are coming again from a parent, from an expert who's actually been on the other side. And I think it just um, makes it very contextual for a lot of people to really understand, you know, rather than having somebody who's who's never been on all these different directions and you've been in these directions and you understand it really well. So. Thank you. Really, really appreciate all the time that you've given us. Thank you so much. Very welcome. Most welcome. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us and listening to the conversation.
If you have any questions about the Pluralist podcast or about the work that we are doing or about the conversation we just had, please reach out to us at projectpluralist at gmail.com. Until next time, thanks so much for tuning in.